Yeah. So we're going to start up again. Paul Hunter is our next reader, our final reader. Um, he lives in Seattle, where he work, has worked as a teacher, and for the past 18 years published letterpress books and broadsides under, under the imprint of Woodworks. His farming poems have been reviewed in the New York Times and have received the Washington State Book Award. That was for Breaking Ground, the first um, book on family farming that, that um, Silverfish published. He has been a featured poet on Jim Lehrer's The News Hour. His most recent book is Prose, One Seed to Another, The, small, the New Small Farming, published by uh, The Small Farmer's Journal. His poems have appeared in Poetry, The Southern Review, The Iowa Review, Poetry Northwest, and Small Farmer's Journal, and other places. Please welcome Paul Hunter. sign. Hens patrolling for bugs argue over the weather. Swallows swoop as one vast wing upswept to feed on the wave of what's coming. A hillside of cattle lie down, tails to the wind, a sure sign. And practically last to notice, crickets urgently stammer to anyone who will listen, get that wash off the line. <laughs> Marjorie asked uh, what, what I was going to read, and I said, this is going to be about romance. <laughs> Part of the romance is the romance of who winds up being uh, a farmer. It's a very naked kind of occupation. And it's a very, uh, it's a self-selecting one as well. But before we get there, let's get young. <clears throat> this is called uh, fanciful. You know the kind of... Uh, ways that farmers will pull your leg. Um, when, when, uh, when Roger mentioned uh, what he did as a young person, the uh, part of the thing that kids wind up doing is they, they, um, they don't know what's a joke and what isn't. And I must tell you that uh, my Indiana relatives still today would baffle some of us by, you know, when I, I asked my mother when I was seven or eight, uh, are my feet too big? Are my feet big? And she looked at me, she looked at my feet, she said, you have a fine understanding. <laughs> Old neighbor farmer Briggs would happen by after supper dishes oftentimes, set on the porch towards sundown, whittling his crook back walking stick, hand around a sack of whorehound drops, bribing us kids to sit quiet, <coughs> suck while he commenced to, to tell about the pair of bats in his barn the other night, made such a squeaky racket deaf or drunk, they put, put him in mind of a horse he had once who'd sit on his tail like a dog, beg for beer in a bucket, and how he once had a Poland China sow could count to seven or nine but not eight, that wintered up under his house that not even the bullpup could fetch, dug into the root cellar there, ate him prittner out of raw turnips, though she got to like them best cooked in a cream sauce with green peas. <laughs> but mostly liked to tell about his cows, 
since we live down a valley mostly flat with his ground higher up above what he called a mountain, a couple of hills where he said his cows grazing there would grow two longer legs on one side to keep them on a level sort of like. And how they'd have to corkscrew around and around to the top where starting home then some got stuck like that pair of identical baby goats Esmeralda hatched once, Pete and Repeat, mostly <laughs> called Little Sir Echo since Pete as the firstborn was boss, like to chase squirrels off the woodshed, then stand up there scared to jump off, cry babies whining all night long, though they'd find a way down to breakfast. But where was I now? Those cows had to back down the whole way they climbed up step by step else coming around the dark side of the mountain might forget which foot they started out on, commence to lean out like to fall, that a ways, clean to the bottom. Like one winter they had one black cow tumble down something awful took to calling her snowball. But if, if they wasn't too old or broke all their legs had to be put out of their misery, their mamas might just take pity, finally teach them right, to know which side was what, lean into that hill, not away, take it a step at a time till eventually come down second nature smooth as pie. And should any kid giggle or cough, roll their eyes, make as if to plug their mouth, he'd point up the side of the mountain, show how their perfect little trails weave into and out of each other, never went straight up and down like a dumb new state highway. <laughs> but sensible, always took the long way round, till by the end, he'd have to make the kids go ask their mama if what all he said weren't the gospel. Watch her planted in the doorway, serious, holding on to herself, something fierce. Say, Mr. Briggs may sound a little fanciful, but they do things different in that thin air way up where he's from. So, behooves us to show some compassion. <laughs> you, 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 you remember being a kid? And kids in the country are a whole nother thing. Uh, anybody here know what a wizard is? Imagine, imagine a, 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 a standard size bicycle that you put a lawnmower engine on it has, runs with belts, and it has coaster brake, the same kind of coaster brake, only it can go 60 miles an hour. And it has a front, you know, it, it has uh, springs on the front, front uh, forks, hard starting. This is a true story, and I'm one of the little kids looking at what's under this tarp. The kid who saved up, bought that wizard motorbike behind his parents' back, praying for the perfect time to ask if he could keep. Hid it in the woodlot where the road would turn and dip just past the neighbor's pasture, whose little, whose small boys, without being told, right off read its whole story, went after chores twice a day to lift the scrap of canvas, study, never touch, spoke, in its presence, in whispers, would have had their tongues cut out to keep it secret. Though something in them knew no thing this loud and fast with rusty tank and tubes all painted blue, dented chrome, tailpipe bruised purple, mushy tires with hardly any brakes, gently wiped wherever it leaked oil, that took such pedaling like hell to mount that rugged uphill slope with them all pushing, running alongside, anything so hard starting, still so beautiful and true, could he get it once to catch, would roar, burn its belts, and spray gravel, turn heartless that instant, and leave them flopping in its dust, its distant past. <laughs> um... I just it suddenly occurred to me that these children we're gonna we're gonna get to the romance. I, I trust, trust me. I'm uh, getting to it right now. 
behind here. First love. This is love at 13 or so. When Ethan appeared after school to help Angelina with chores, even the little ones knew from their stiff, silent dance something was up, just not what. Though they could see clear from the hen house, he wasn't helping with theirs. And after that first teasing chant shushed by their mother, they noticed their sister was given a job away off in the orchard where through that fall, planting the ladder with the greatest possible care, he'd help her clean every tree. They'd take turns catching the apples the other would toss down, then sort in four baskets for market, eating, pie, and cider. Precise as any grown-ups, finally gather windfalls for the pigs where sleepy yellow jackets, still abuzz in their moldy, frost-bitten cores, would draw her small O oh, of surprise that he would mirror, steadying her on tiptoe, long and lean, kerchief round her flowing hair, contained, <coughs> reaching out overhead where he dreamt of catching her falling, kept his eyes up, his feet planted as she with eyes averted would bestow on him from her apron <coughs> pocket the best, ripest one from each tree, perfect for his dark walk home, for his personal eating. See? That romance? <laughs> And then we move on a few years and a different person and a different story. Spoiled. Um, this is one of the parts of, of country life that you must uh, understand or not, not understand. You might, this is what sends some people screaming and howling away from it. That people uh, in a small communities can be cruel. That can, they can even develop that cruelty, and that the cruelty can be turned on certain people. Spoiled. Along the porch of an evening, they still like to tell on how Marie, her first job babysitting, hardly more than half a child herself, going to change diapers, threw up all over the baby. <laughs> Consider the verdict unanimous. She'd never had to dig enough manure that sure would like to have toughened her. <laughs> Marie, not a blister or callous. Marie, studious, quiet, lyrical, never a hair out of place, devout, patient, mindful, effortless, kind word or deed for anyone who asked what boys these parts would call a natural though to her face they'd say spoiled, who'd congratulate themselves for knowing she would get all she could handle and more from the common pig yard fund of excrement when she got in the family way, 17 disowned, compelled to settle for a hard scrabble place away back in the hills, skinny fool with his dirty hands full and no truck with politeness, took to calling her princess. Still, the boys love best these tales of her early comeuppance, told over like they really can't recall what was beside the point or could turn back the clock to that picnic somehow once Marie got the bumblebees and her hair had to jump in the frog pond, turned her lacy dress all green, stank with the slime that the rest of the day stuck to her. Not, I don't want you to hear the anger as the only note there, but there are those things. 
where the going got rough. Um, just to take a breather from the romantic theme, uh, this is corruption in the country. A little kind of corruption in the country that wouldn't hurt anybody. Uh, true, true story. Our, out past our village crossroads where all the back roads were gravel, rutted, humpbacked, broken up, like to shake and loose your final wisdom tooth. The county road superintendent, like he was lord of the turnpike with gold keys to the bank vault, had the road paved to his door. Buzz Buckley, that bull of a man, so called for the no-nonsense haircut, a rarity those shaggy times, these parts, who in conversation led with his forehead like a concrete block with two little glittering eyes like mica stove windows set back in the shadows underneath. That to hear him tell it worked a hundred hours a week, the odd blizzard emergency landslide round the clock. And even when he got sacked for what the papers termed peculation, taking that truckload of rock salt meant to give us all traction home to feed his own cattle. That blacktop, so easy, so slick, still stopped at his place to remind us right where the going got tough. <laughs> the... Uh, This is the part of romance that's the hardest to sell, but it is, the, it is real. Uh, people don't do farming for generations without an affection, a deep abiding affection for the soil itself. And this is, this is a poem called Reward Enough the Being Left Alone, and it's about um, maybe a love affair with a certain field. And, um, <laughs> and I can't make a joke of it. Among the fields we work in turn, this one has grown somehow favored for the angle of the low spring sun that catches and warms it, how the mist encircles its fence lines, how it <coughs> holds the downhill runoff, yet dries up, dries out, firms up earliest to let us get into and work right when we need to begin to feel useful and shake off the drowsy winter's plodding, shivering burn to put seed in the ground. That set back furthest from the road allows nobody passing to admire what's poking up, leafing out, see how we're getting on, much less turn jealous what looks from a distance to scarce amount to anything just yet. Though with a smattering of clues, a birdhouse, every other fence post, with its lyrical outspoken sentinel, straw to mulch the row crops, and along fences, lush undergrowth, bees in wildflowers, delirious. And now with hard red winter wheat and hay grown together, both finished, that fine clover timothy mix, its leaf curl and fragrance cured perfect, that calves appear to more than tolerate for its sunny taste on the darkest of days. Having yielded us the finest corn and beans, now wheat and hay in living memory, delivered all we could ask of a soil crumbly and fine as ancient cheese, dark as a moonless night past the first of the year, drowsing, fragrant, expectant. Around the kitchen table it's agreed our favorite has earned a rest a fallow year with the stubble left to hold a place for what's to come. Reward enough the being left alone through another winter slumber. That's the actual source of the title, Stubble Field. There it is. Uh, and 
you know what I hate? I hate anybody standing up here who explains things. Because the hardest thing is to just be the things. Clover and Timothy, for instance. I've been reading a book that was published in 1799. This is a guy who met George Washington. A book on farming. And he talks about how Clover and Timothy do so well together because the, the Timothy, which is this tall, pointy, spiky thing with a tassel on the top of it, is, supports the clover that wants to kind of otherwise fall over. <coughs> Very cool. Um, I'm going to play a tune. This is 
a ten-year-old girl, her first Turned 10 that fall, first cow she knew got to see, shot in the head, throat slid, hung up by its heels from the same A-frame they used to pull the engine out of the mouth of the old dead car. Not ribeye, but gush buckets of nothing like oil, then beheaded its still forehead curls dropped in the dust over huge sightless eyes, cut away four cloven feet, Filthy tail, body slit, watching silver blue guts issue forth, steaming into a wash tub, dragged to the pit. Skin worried, loose, peeled off, tacked inside out to dry like a fur coat lined in red velvet. Body let hang too long, nights, day between, in plain sight, shrouded in cheesecloth, its bulk flecked with flies in late sunlight, like a saint already purified, remote. Then sawed down the middle, each half cut apart in a, on a table of sawhorses, planks, chickens pecking droplets underfoot, parts cut and wrapped for the deep freeze on brown paper, grease pencil scribbles, how many of what, plus the date in the dark, in the cold, neatly stacked for winter like so many snowy bricks, the first thawed to cook up with no bones about it, that with vegetables hope to look enough unlike a certain young cow, it might coax a taste from her by way of nourishment. Maybe not fair, but... But we need to bring that up. We need to bring it up. And if we go to near the end of this book, we will find a little poem called Not to Trust. You know, we've romanticized, and, and in, in a way it's not, a, it's not fair. Some say don't name the ones you plan to eat. Though the same ones say they don't have feelings which you'd have to be made of stone not to see. How they know not to trust us with the most elemental things. Take a young cow bred for the dairy or beef herd in her wrenching first labor. Takes watching, keeping her close. She'll want to steal away to a thicket the end of the pasture, have her baby there all to herself, no matter how it hurts, how confused, overburdened, lost, hide from us till she feels well enough to stagger back around, show off this tiny new life given to her, not to us. Any of you guys ever seen a baby mule? Baby mule. Just sort of drink it in. Um, they have what uh, biologists like to call hybrid, what do they call it? Hybrid vitality. That is a hybrid between the mare and the, the female horse and the male donkey. Between them, it is something better than either. Swirling up light as it, this is called Skeeter. This was the name of this baby mule. They don't have, we don't have a special name for baby mule. I want you to notice. You know, we have, we have colts and calves and foals and, you know, and bunnies. And we don't have a name for baby mule. And you're visiting with, visiting we, with this, this one with me. Swirling up, light as a snowflake once the mare dropped him, breath caught in his tissues and sticks. 
So by the time he's licked dry, he isn't rickety, all set up to be fed on collapsible legs that would spring into the air to, like Dad said, shake the dust of mortality. Maybe any newborn mule finished before he's begun, fixed from birth with no future, just doesn't want to be hitched to the day any more than a boy craves pulling a wagon load of damp feathers. So inquisitive for the moment, carefree, ignorant of rules, lending his long-eared attention to anything living, trailed after mouse or moth, snorting, teeth clacking, low to the ground or mid-air. Though in time he would settle, start a load and walk, eventually plod even blinded straight ahead, that first year there was no telling would he ever grow into his dignity, stand to be harnessed to draw the life he was meant for, light-hearted, shivering, leaping, part frog, part cricket, part crow, part butterfly. And we have I have a, a poem in Come the Harvest called Luminaries, and it is about a romance between two very shy people. If Charlie could get Eveline off her parents' porch swing, away from their yellow bug light, out in the cool night air, even along in their 30s, anything might still be possible. Since she had already tried the city boyfriend and job, neither quite working out, once more home for the summer, what might be his last chance. Since childhood, having known each other, both observed the perfect decorum of those who since first grade, well aware of the other's cosmic whereabouts, find themselves closer than words, though they've hardly actually spoken. So cultivating, he thought deep down the endless cornrows for weeks, enduring a herky-jerk parade of sleepless nights, until at last, in a fit, he summoned up what at the time she'd given scant regard, his high school science project. Went straight to the pastor at church, asked permission to start an astronomy club that won the steely eye the blunt response, for what? He said, share the wonders of God. Which is how the farmers came Sunday night in the dark to stand around his cardboard tube on its hind legs in the gravel church parking lot, taking turns at the eyepiece, careful not to bump as each leaving off tags the next until all have gotten an eyeful of the night's heavenly bodies, of which the celebrity dipped up in his homemade ladle would appear to be Saturn laid out on velvet like a moth on the skin of a frog pond, quivering, iridescent, trying not to flutter lest something beyond make a meal of it. Slight enough magic that yet gives Eveline reason to approach, ask after distant luminaries brighter for the darkened countryside, her gardenia scent modestly intimate. As in reverend whispers, they wonder how Charlie could have ground by, by hand a perfect saucer of this chunk of glass adjusted until you could see practically anything you'd care to look at. Though nothing remains sharp for long, a few minutes and it swims away out of their ken. Still gives Charlie excuse to hover about and refocus, offer cookies, a thermos of coffee, though soon as one farmer commences yawning till the others catch his drift, the gathering evaporates until with no one else about, he spreads a blanket over dewy grass where both sit stiff-necked, lean back, still thankful for something to look at, as he points out the few he can recall, and she makes up names for a couple as the night wheels on parade. Their few points of meaning half hid by endless, nameless, scattered lights where reaching through all that 
emptiness. Their fluttering hands touch at last. And the last poem from this called practically a proposal. Not much for a romancing. Charlie still put on red suspenders and red socks, slicked his hair back to show up front what all he had left. Even parked his good hat on the dash to drop by after supper come to find Eveline alone on her porch swing, figured to take this main chance to parcel out his thoughts that had become such a burden, like a load of green firewood you need to quit driving around, throw off someplace, and stack near where you're fixing to burn it. So he sat down in the rocker opposite, admired her print dress and earrings, studied her folding her hands, then opened with the offering, you know, I, I can't cook a thing but brown gravy which made her smile and say how good that goes with everything but canned peaches. <laughs> which brought a chuckle just enough, just enough to rear back, put her in gear, and get started. Allowing as how he'd had his eye on the old jinx place, which he knew twice a day she drove past, had never been much to look at, though the house had a decent tin roof, plus the barn side facing the road, still whispered, chew mail patch. Now all so overgrown it hid what everyone knew how old man Jinx couldn't raise ticks on a coonhound, had a religious aversion to soap and paint, so no telling what kind of eyesore heaven he might have got to killed off by his own cussedness. But left alone so long, his place might be tired just laying around, set to start him growing if the ground could be reminded how that's done not into all fired of a hurry, but spread manure first and turn under since he'd heard the asking price was already down in the toilet, just might make a farm once more. Besides which, Lord knows I am willing right as rain to make a go, which was practically a proposal. So they turned and got down to cases started lining things out on a paper sack which he unfolded from a hip pocket with a tooth mark pencil stub for exactly this occasion working out where to plant grapes for an arbor to sit under Sunday afternoons. Plus, if she'd like a cherry tree, maybe peach, and a rhubarb patch for some pies, a swing in the yard to one side, a bird bath, some roses, the reddest sort of red to hurt your eye, and by the kitchen door, some dogwood, some lilac, for Scythia, as together on a roll, by now they went dreaming how it all might be, never mind the money, what it is you need to start out on the right foot, till on paper they had the place planted, every leafy, living, dog-eared possibility, till at last there seemed nothing left but the obvious that Charlie swallowed hard, leaned in to ask, how many sprouts to this row do you figure? Waggling his big thumb so there'd be no mistake between them, back and forth, and without blinking, she answered, two boys and two girls, the Lord willing, hands full for the both of us. Then they got up and walked a little ways off in the starry dark across the fields until the dew settled and stopped them like a silly coal black puppy underfoot, craving someone to play with, slobbering all over their good shoes.